This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. My guest today has been on a journey to help young women make the choice for life during the confusion of an unwanted pregnancy. Amy Ford can speak to women considering an abortion with clarity because of her own journey. If abortion became illegal or unthinkable tomorrow or today, uh, you don't really think the church would be ready at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, if abortion became illegal and Roe v. Wade was overturned tomorrow, mm -hmm. there would be a lot of women that are pregnant and really upset that they didn't have access to an abortion. And we can't, as the church, just say, good luck, hope it works out for you. Yeah. Um, you know, go along on your way. We've got to be ready to help spiritually, practically, and emotionally um, these women that are going to need help um, and, and help them get back on their feet and pointed to Jesus and, and just help with um, all the things that they need to be able to feel empowered in their life decision and to not feel like they were forced in a certain way, but to make it so that it's, I love that word unthinkable. Like there's so many resources out there. Why would I even feel like I need to have an abortion mm -hmm. when there's so much help? And that's where the church can come in. Yeah. Well, this book, Help Her Be Brave, uh, Discovering Your Place in the Pro-Life Movement, birthed out of your own story, right? I mean, that, yeah. uh, you, uh, a few years back, uh, you now have a son that's 20, <laughs> what, 22? 22. Tell us where it all started. Yeah, so I had an unexpected pregnancy when I was 19. I grew up in a Christian home. I had a, an amazing family, but I didn't have a relationship with the Lord. And so I, um, I ended up finding myself pregnant. And I was so terrified to tell my parents, you know, the enemy lies to you in mm -hmm. that situation. You think of the worst case scenarios. You're going to be homeless. You're going to be the black sheep of the family. Everyone's going to hate you. You know, all of these horrible things. And so I had decided, as well as the father of the baby, that we were just going to get an abortion and we'll deal with the consequences of a broken heart later and let's just do it and get it over with. And we just thought, you know, it's almost like pressing a button, like it will, it'll just, let's just move past it. And you both, and so at we that went time, you, you both had decided that. I mean, both of you had made that decision. Yeah. Yeah, we had paid for it and everything, and we just were like, we just have to do this. And so we paid for it and everything, went to the abortion clinic, and they made uh, the father of the baby wait in the waiting room. I went into the abortion room, and as they were explaining all that they were going to do, I ended up hyperventilating and passing out in the abortion room. And I think just all of the emotions and everything I had just tried to suppress and, and to not think through everything, but um, I ended up just hyperventilating and passing out. So when I came to, the nurses were fainting me, trying to give me a drink of water, and they said, you're too emotionally distraught to make this decision today. You can come back another day, but today you're not getting an abortion. And so I went back out in the waiting room, told the father of the baby, which we had been together for four years, and we knew in the future we wanted to get married, um, but we didn't, we didn't know that the timing was going to be like this, mm -hmm. but I told him, you know, we're still pregnant. And in that moment, we just decided, okay, like if we're going to be homeless, if our parents are going to hate us, all those terrible things, mm -hmm. then at least we'll, we're going to figure it out together. So we did tell our parents it wasn't as bad as the, what the enemy lies to you. You know, fear makes you do crazy sure. things. Um, and so it wasn't as bad as we thought. They were definitely disappointed, but we, and we ended up getting married because we knew we wanted to anyway. So when I was 16 weeks pregnant, we got married and, um, it was like, you know, even it just we had a hard time even finding a pastor that would marry us. The man that had led my husband to the Lord years before we asked him if he would marry us. And he mm -hmm. said, I'm sorry that you've sinned. And so I can't marry you. Wow. And we were like, oh, my goodness, we are such horrible people. We can't even get married. Right. You know. And so um, we found someone else that would marry us, but it was just a day of like, it felt like a scarlet letter. You know, uh, you just yeah. like so much shame. And after that, we tried to go back to church, but it's like the elephant in the room. People don't know whether to say congratulations or I'm sorry. So they don't say anything. And then you feel alone in a crowd of people. But one thing that's really cool. Well, a few things. One is I had a son and he's amazing. And like you said, he's 22 mm -hmm. um, now. Mm -hmm. And we actually have four kids. But with my son, he even just graduated from Oral Roberts University. Um, he majored in theology. He wants to be a pastor. He has such a heart and passion for the Lord and for evangelism. And uh, he says that he was an overcomer before he was ever even born and that Satan had a plan to take him out. But he's here and he wants to use this story in his life to change the world. And I love it. Yeah, we, want, it looks yeah. 
We want to, we want to talk about Jess a little bit and a little bit later on about his response to all this and, and what it did in his life. But you really did have a struggle finding a church. I mean, you're, you're, you're struggling to, to get accepted or get some kind of uh, acceptance from the church, and yet you're kind of moving around at that point in time. What was your relationship and your husband's relationship with Christ as you were searching around to find a body of believers that you could really settle into who knew your story? Yeah, well, we definitely believed in in God, and we I went to a Christian private school my whole life, but I just didn't have a relationship with the Lord. You know, God creates the, us to, to crave intimacy, and sometimes we use things or people to fill those voids when we're not going to Christ for that, and that's um, kind of the situation we were in when we first got married, and so even just trying to find a spiritual family, a church home was really hard. Um, and again, I don't think, I hear horror stories of people that are really, um, hurt by the church. And I don't think it was necessarily um, hurt. It was more like I was saying before, it's like people just don't really know how to respond. Mm -hmm. So they just don't say anything. And I'm a very extrovert person. And really? I have a lot of friends. <laughs> yeah. It's, hard to tell. Friends. it's kind of obvious when all of a sudden all my friends stop talking, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it just was kind of awkward um, for a while. But we ended up, so we just stopped going for like a really long time. And then we'd after, you know, maybe in a couple years, we'd go try one church and didn't really like, you know, couldn't find a fit. And then we tried a different one. But I know we were also struggling with our own guilt and shame, you know, mm -hmm. that we hadn't come to Christ and asked for forgiveness. So, so you were still struggling with the guilt and the shame. Had, had you tried your parents' church, things like that, but they had accepted you. They had, had they forgiven you? Yes. Uh, but you're still struggling with, with forgiveness in yourself. I mean, that you could, could you forgive each other? Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, so we could forgive our, our, uh, each other, but it was still just kind of our own self, like how we knew better, you know, and, um, but I, even that pastor that wouldn't marry us, he called us um, a couple of years later, and he called my husband, and he asked for forgiveness, he felt, he said he felt like it was his worst mistake in pastoring history that he had wow. ever made will you please forgive me and my husband who loves this guy like I said he had discipled him and mentored him and and um, he just loves him and he was like yes I forgive you and even to this day they are such great friends and so that was a really big part of our healing uh, journey too is just for that that um, that friendship and everything being reunited and they still I mean they talk at least once a week now and um, you know and that was 22 years ago they're still great friends let, let me ask you that Jess was 16 at that time but uh, he already knew that you almost aborted him uh, at some point in time you have to sit down and have that conversation uh, how did that go yeah that was really hard um, when he was 13 is when I had the conversation because my first book a bump in life came out and I was about to be on some, you know, James Robinson and some other shows, and I was really going to be telling the story. So I took him to the Cheesecake Factory and sat him down, and um, I had all my friends praying. And me and my husband, we we and it's we you know we have four kids, so it's mm -hmm. kind of weird. He felt kind of weird of like, why are you just taking me? Yeah. Out? Um, and so I we had we took him to dinner, and I told him everything. And and I was so I had all my friends praying because I didn't want him to ever take it as rejection because sure. we were young kids you know we didn't know what we needed at the time and god knew and so i told him everything he's a typical 13 year old boy because i was like how does this make you feel you know i'm trying to get some kind of response uh -huh. out of him and he's like i don't know you know he doesn't really know at 13 years old how to how to articulate that quite yet mm -hmm. but um over the next few weeks he um he came back to me and he said and mom, the youth group at my church, we go to Gateway Church and they asked me to come speak about being an overcomer and I'm supposed to speak for five minutes. And he said, how does this sound? And so he read me what he had wrote and it was that he was an overcomer before he was ever even born and that Satan had a plan to take him out, but he's here and he wants to use his story to change the world. And I just, I was like, yes, <laughs> Lord. And there was a season in between there of coming to that revelation. The enemy lied to him just like he lied to me about you weren't, you weren't wanted and that you weren't planned, even though we know that God plans all lives. But it took him a little while to get there. And once he did, and once he really captured that word from the Lord, um, he flew. And so now to see his passion is to, to know that he's here for a purpose and a reason, just like we all are, and that he wants to uh, be a voice for hope in Christ and, and all of that. He's very passionate about the Lord, and I love that. 
I'll continue my conversation with Amy Ford in a moment, and we'll find out how you can make an impact with young women struggling with the choice of abortion. Also, how the church can reach out and make a difference to girls during this difficult storm in their lives. As the climate in our world grows more hostile toward our Christian worldview, Viewpoint is a program designed to help defend our faith. Each week, Bob Placey interviews guests who bring the Bible into focus. And we can be salt and light in this culture. Every description of Babylon in this book is going to come to pass. Helping us understand how relevant God's Word is for today. Viewpoint is completely viewer supported. If you've enjoyed and benefited from our interviews, we would ask you to consider helping us by supporting it financially. Your 20, 50, or even $100 monthly gift will help us continue to bring you more of these programs. Go to WTLW.com now and click Get Involved or you can send a check to the address on your screen. Thank you for supporting Viewpoint. Viewpoint with Bob Placey is now available as a podcast. Download your favorite podcast app like iTunes, Google Play, or Spotify and search for Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Subscribe and listen as we discuss these important topics each week. We are back with the author of Help Her Be Brave, Discover Your Place in the Pro-Life Movement, Amy Ford. So glad to have you. It's, it's uh, your own story, really birthed the, this book and, and bump in the road, I think. But uh, we want to talk about the ministry that uh, has come out of this. I mean, God has done some amazing things through a, a scared 19-year-old girl and her husband after they had a, almost had an abortion, but chose not to. And now he's used that. At what point in time... Uh, did you, 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 you guys were kind of looking for a church. When did you really come back full, full boat? We're back, we're back to the Lord. We know he's got something for us. When did all that take place? Well, I, um, when Jess, my son, was about um, seven or eight, we found um, a church that we just felt like it was home, and it's Gateway Church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Pastor Robert Morris. He's amazing. And so I kind of really started getting plugged in more and more and more and helping. Um, I, I love to decorate, you know, and I, I, I signed up to decorate at a, a women's conference. And that was really that women's conference of that first time that I really got plugged into the church and serving was when God really dreamed down an idea and a vision into my heart. And it was um, just of why don't we help women with unplanned pregnancies and throw them a baby shower. And so I went to the group's pastor, told her about what I had heard from God. And she's like, why don't you just start a small group and let's just see what happens. And uh, so we started a little small group, Embrace Grace is what we called it, there at the church. And we just kind of used word of mouth and told people, hey, we're gonna start the small group. And three girls came. One wore a coat in August in Texas because she was terrified of stepping foot into a church and letting anyone see that she was pregnant. They wouldn't make eye contact. There was just a hopelessness about them. And one was even still thinking about an abortion. And so it was amazing. It's a 12 weeks. And we just really talk about identity value and worth and how much God loves them so, so much. We shared the gospel with them and it was cool to see over the 12 weeks how they were transforming from the inside out. They had hope again. They're, they weren't, you know, before they wouldn't make eye contact, their shoulders were sagging. It was just a hopelessness to, after the 12 weeks, being empowered as women to be the mom that God created them to be, whether they chose to place their baby for adoption or parent. And so it was awesome to see. And that wasn't that it wasn't just a 12 week one and done, you know, um, program. They they all got saved and they all got connected into the church. And, and you know, the church can help for our whole lives. A lot of pro-choice people say, well, you only care about the baby. You don't care about the mom. And that's not true. Like we are all a spiritual family and we'll walk alongside her for her whole life if she'll allow it, you know, and, and because that's what a family does. And if she'll stay connected mm -hmm. and, and, um, and cause we all need community and connection and that's what we're 
created for. We're created to help each other. And so that's what we want to do as the church. So this Embrace Grace just blossomed. We did it again. Three more girls came, then eight, then 14, then 21. And it just started growing. And then other churches started calling us saying, this is really cool. Will you show us how to do it too? And we'd send these Word documents and started realizing, oh, God wants us to maybe help people help people. We're focused on this group at our church, which is awesome. But now all these other churches are saying, will you send us the curriculum, what you guys have been writing for these girls? And it just blossomed. And now we're in almost 700 churches, 47 states and 10 countries doing Embrace Grace. How did you come up with that first curriculum? I mean, you start with three girls, you found them some way. I mean, how do you get three, first of all, how do you get three girls to come to church that are considering abortion and make them feel welcome? But what about the curriculum? How did you develop something that, did, did that come out of what God was revealing through your own life, what you would have needed at the time? Yeah, for sure. I, I, when we prayed about a name, we really felt like Embrace Grace was it. And then we started Googling like single and pregnant curriculum. There was no such thing as single and pregnant <laughs> curriculum. And so one day we Googled Embrace Grace and there was a book by Liz Curtis Higgs. And a lot of you probably have heard of her. She's amazing. She's written like Bad Girls of the Bible and some awesome great books and she has a book called embrace grace We're like that's really weird there's a book called it so we ordered it and it wasn't about being um having an unplanned pregnancy but it was just about grace mm-hmm. and god's love mm-hmm. for them and it was so good and we were like well, let's just use this so we used that at the very beginning but then over time as we did it over and over again we started seeing oh we need to add this in and add that in and we really started developing into our whole a, a curriculum um, of w- knowing what they needed and they get a baby shower, they get a princess day where it's all about how much God loves them and their identity in Christ and have a hair team and makeup team that makes them beautiful on the outside. They have a night with the king where it's a full dinner. Um, it's just about God's God's love for them because if they can really get that, mm-hmm. like not just in their head, really get that in their heart, that's when all the things they shouldn't be doing becomes things they don't want to do anymore because they fall in love with him and he's who transforms their hearts. You know, the church is so many girls when I, you know, you were asking about like, how do you find these girls? I, I ask God to show them to me all the time and I have found them in the craziest of places. But um, it uh, usually when I ask them to go, their first reaction is like, wait, what? You want me to go to church? Like, do you know yeah. the situation? And, and it's sad that their first response is that, that they think, and then when I get them to come, they're like, oh, you know, you guys are so nice. I thought y'all were going to tell me that I needed, you know, that I was such a, that I'm a bad person and I need to change all of these things. And, and first she just needs to feel love, you know, and, and it's sad that they think that the church is about behavior modification when really it should be about a heart transformation and because God is who changes our hearts. You know, it's not our job to fix people. It's our job to love people and introduce them to the Holy spirit. And he's who convicts and, and guides, and we can help mentor them along the way, point them to scripture and all of that. But love is what transforms people. The scripture says it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. It's God's love that transforms people. And so if they can't even feel that from the church or from his people, then where where else will they know or get a tiny glimpse of God's love for them? And so just that love, even from the baby showers of people going out of their way, buying things for their baby, the uh, people in the church that they've never met before, they're just so overwhelmed. We've seen women um, surrender their life to Jesus the night of the baby shower because they're so overwhelmed by the love that's given. You know, we call it a big, giant prodigal party. I mean, it's amazing. And we've had at, at our church at Gateway, you know, again, it was the original one. We even do um, altar calls and we our baby shower. People get saved at it. And I just think that is so awesome yeah. um, to see the church love in this way. Yeah, You'd mentioned the transforming power and. Uh, a little snapshot of these girls, you, you'd mentioned it earlier, but the first three girls coming in, what really motivates that decision, uh, I'm going to get an abortion? Is it fear? Is it, how do you transform that to acceptance and to uh, uh, I'm loved by God if, it, if it, it is fear? Give me a snapshot of that girl coming in and then a snapshot of that girl going out when yeah, she completes fear. the 12 weeks. Right. Fear definitely is the root of every abortion decision. I mean, if you look at all of the top reasons, it's, you know, fear of not having enough money, fear of my parents being mad, fear of my school interrupt being interrupted or having to drop out of school. Um, Fear is the root. And so if we can help her be brave, which is what my book is about, 
how can we help her overcome that fear? And, you know, I wish there was a book I could write where it's like A plus B equals C, you know, that you do this thing and then you do this thing and a baby save and a woman is empowered. It's very much a Holy Spirit led, um, very unique situations for each of these women of what they might be going through in that time of, of thinking, oh my goodness, abortion might be, be what I need to do. But if we can help her get out of that tunnel vision and see the bigger picture and um, help her get, get past that, it changes everything. And so what my heart is in this book is that we all have strengths, gifts, passions inside of us. Every single one of us, me, you, everyone that's watching right now, we all have something to give. And so what is it? What like to really tap into our heart? Like, what is that thing that makes us pound our fist on the table and say, someone needs to do something about this? Because a lot of times that's what God, God is stirring your heart to be the be one you. to be the change. That's you. Right? And so even with this issue, what do we have to give? to these women. Are you great at helping a girl with her resume? Write a resume. Are you great at um, helping babysit? You love kids and you want to help with that. Do you want to help her with maybe uh, cooking a meal sometimes? You know, being a single mom is really hard. There's so many different things that we can do with the strengths and gifts God placed inside of us. And we're all working together as a church family, as a body of believers to help her be brave. We can make abortion unthinkable together. So this book is just full of ideas. Yeah of how people can get involved um, using the gifts that God placed in them. Yeah, and, the, and the book gives you a lot of great practical ideas, but at the same time you'd mentioned you need to be led by the Holy Spirit. I mean, you've got girls coming in, and you've got a couple of different populations. You've got girls maybe from the street, girls who've never been in a church. Then you've got the church girl. You may have somebody who is considering an abortion and they're not going to now, they're going to raise their child or they're going to give it up for adoption, which is a whole other set of issues. And so you really have to be led by the Holy Spirit on how to individually uh, share with each of these girls and, and lead them in the direction that God, God intends them to go. Yeah, and I love that you even mentioned, you know, outside of the church, you know, there are so many pastors that I talk to that I'll, you know, tell them about Embrace Grace or what they can do to get involved. And they're like, oh, we don't have pregnant girls at the church. And we're like, um, yes, you do. <laughs> hey, it is like all over people and you really don't have someone that maybe would have an unexpected pregnancy and it's a small church. Well, looking at it as an outreach, go find them, go partner with pregnancy centers in your community and go tell them, Hey, when you have a girl that has an, uh, an unexpected pregnancy, tell her that we want her at our church. We have an embrace grace group or whatever that might look like. Invite them in. Look at this as an outreach. Like you would go feed the poor or the homeless, like pro life and, and helping these women. It could be an outreach. I've even seen people find them on Facebook buy, sell trade pages because they'll post on there. I just found out I'm pregnant and I need a, you know, a car seat and I don't know what to do. I'm really scared. And they, we found them on there. I mean, they're everywhere. We just, ha I ask God every day if he'll put kingdom goggles on me so I can see the people that need hope that I need to speak a word to, that I need to invite to a church, you know, whatever that might look like. And God's bringing us people all the time, but I, I looking at it as an outreach and then also looking at, yes, do you have women in your church that have an unexpected pregnancy because the abortion rate is exactly the same inside the church as it is outside. Yeah. There's no difference. And so being oh, saying, uh, you know, even from a platform, like if someone experiences an unexpected pregnancy that our church, we're here to help you and to guide you in this decision. Don't run away from us please come to us yeah. um, uh, for guidance and help through this situation. And it would help prevent a lot of abortions if we were more grace filled in our response to this issue. Yeah. There's a lot of people outside the church who think that think it's basically just a, a political fight and the church being the Christian church is just politically against abortion. And it stops that, that we're against killing babies. But how do we convince more and more people that what we're for, we're for loving those mothers, we're loving, for loving those babies, loving the families that adopt those babies, loving the mother afterwards as she raises that baby. How do we, how do we convince the world that we're not just against killing babies, which we are, but we're for loving these people? Yeah, I mean, a really, abortion is a trauma. It is a, a I mean, all, I have so many women that have experienced an abortion and they are stuff, they still have PTSD symptoms, all kinds of stuff, and it's years later. Like, we, no one wants that for someone. But I think also just have it saying, you know, having abortion healing groups in churches are really um, important, too, because if there's anyone that's listening right now and you've experienced an abortion, I just want you to know. 
that God loves you and that he, all you have to do is ask for forgiveness and he wants to forgive you and he loves you so much and you're not disqualified for ministry. You are qualified because Revelation 12, 11 says we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And so don't think that you're disqualified from helping in some way because of what your story is. You can be the person that you wish you had years ago in your life when you made your abortion decision. You can be that change that you want to see in the world. And so I think just really being more about what we're for. We're for life. We're for love. We don't have to do uh, big sermons on why abortion is wrong. I think deep down, a lot of us already know that. It's more about like, why would we need to look at all of the help that our church can give to help a woman feel empowered in her life? decision whether she chooses to place her baby for adoption or chooses to parent will help you and if the girl does go and get an abortion which we don't want her to but if she did then the church is a safe place for her to come back to for yeah. healing and and to go through an abortion healing support group that are so very important it should be in every church in the nation well you do have a, a several spinoff i wouldn't call them spinoff groups but embrace grace Embrace legacy and you got to embrace mercy coming. Tell me about some of those real quickly, what, how the church can even get involved in some of those as we follow up with these families of people that at one time considered an abortion. Yeah, so we have Embrace Grace that is for when they're pregnant. Those are support groups that you could do. It's digital um, uh, teaching, so it's super easy. Just press play. And there's um, and you can find the girls. It's word word of mouth and partnering with their local pregnancy centers. You can find girls, invite them into your church. We have Embrace Life, which is for single young moms, and so that's a 22 week class that's also digital and really amazing. And you do it at the church. We have Embrace Legacy that's for the dads that is launching this March, which wow. we're really excited about. And um, Embrace Mercy is something we hope in the in the near future is for the parents of of these women or men that are experiencing an unexpected pregnancy. So. We just want to wrap our arms around all everyone that's affected by this and show that, you know, this is a miracle and that God does plan for every single life, whether that mom planned this baby or not. God for sure planned this life. And this baby is a blessing. Well, it, it definitely shows the power of God to take a 19 year old girl and, and, and her future husband and develop all of this. But the book is Help Her Be Brave. Discover Your Place in the Pro-Life Movement. A lot of good practical information here. Forward's written by Jim Daly, president of Focus on the Family. So you've got a lot of people behind you. But uh, give me the, uh, the website quickly. If there's a church out there right now saying, hey, we got to get started. What do we need? Yeah, embracegrace.com. You can get all the information that you need. Also, helperbebrave.com has more information, too, about our podcast and it with lots of ideas to get involved in the movement and more information about the book. Thanks to Amy Ford for joining us today. You can find all of her books in Christian bookstores and online. Please share this episode with your friends, and you can find all of our interviews on YouTube under Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Thanks for watching. Remember, you can watch the interviews you've seen today on demand on YouTube. Plus, you can also listen to all of our episodes on the Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to a podcast.